thank you. You are a good, a holy, and awesome, and a gracious God. Father, we pray for this message, that it would be yours, the message you got to have for your people. May the proud be brought low. May the humble be lifted up. Bless this time and this worship in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're doing something a little bit different here on Sunday mornings. What we have been doing is going through the book of Romans verse by verse. But this morning we're going to do something a little bit different. Our youth went to Philadelphia for a week. I was one of four, four adult chaperones on this trip. I think there was 14 of them. And they went to some place called Fuse. It was Fuse Camps. During this camp, there is a biblical theme for every single day. They go out and they minister to the community. They help with the sick or the homeless, with children. Uh, it really is a wonderful camp experience. But each full day has a theme. And so I kind of came to the conclusion that instead of just our youth experiencing these themes, we as the greater body of Christ should experience these themes with them. We paid for them to go. They were blessed. We ought to be blessed as a body of Christ. Amen. So there were four themes on four full days of Fuse. The first theme was this. We talked about it last week. Be His. Everybody say that with me. Be His. The second theme on the second full day was be last. Everybody say that with me. Be last. The third theme that we'll talk about next week was this. Be real. Everybody say that with me. Be real. And the last theme was be bold. Say that one with me. Be bold. Last week we talked about how we were God, made God's children through faith in Jesus Christ. Today we're going to talk about being last. To be last. Well, that's not very popular in our culture today, isn't it? To be last. As a matter of fact, how many times do you hear the child say this? A parent says to the child, hey, how'd you do in the race today? And they get all giddy and they get all excited. Mom, Dad, you'll never believe it. I came in last. It was fantastic. You don't hear that often. Do you know, when I was a child, Jim was basically a torture chamber. All right, I was that chubby little kid, that little boy. I never went home and said, oh, Mommy, Daddy, guess what? And they said, what? I got picked last for dodgeball. It was fantastic. It was unbelievable. In Jim, they used to have this torture device called the rope. I don't know if they still do this. But in front of the entire class, it was just basically an, an exercise in pure humiliation for chubby children. You had to climb that rope. And the whole class looks at you as you try and get on the first knot of the rope. And that's as far as you go. I loved it. It was great. I was always last. You know, you don't see the bumper sticker on the back of cars. You know, what we see is we see, my child is an honor student at blah, 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 school. By the way, if I ever put that bumper sticker on my car, I give you permission to hit me. All right. <laughs> Uh, so that's what we have. We have that bumper sticker. Oh, my kid is amazing. All right, great. Well, bumper sticker we don't have is this. My kid does really bad at school. You don't slap that bumper sticker on your car. You don't want to be last. As a matter of fact, have you ever noticed that parents always think their kid is brilliant? You'll never know what little Johnny did. He's brilliant. He's like in the top five percentile. Every little child is amazing. No parent ever says, you know what, <laughs> my kid dumb, he's last. No, no parent ever says that. Because being last is what? It's bad. We don't like to be last. Being last means you're at the end of the pack. Being last means you didn't succeed, there was no victory. Nobody wants to be last. Okay. <laughs> my, you know what my wife just said? Under her breath, I heard her, she goes, the Detroit Lions. <laughs> yeah. Even from my wife. And I don't like it. But so I think I'm pretty clear about that. The disciples didn't like being last either. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 1, this scripture is used. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Look at that verse just for a moment. Does it say one disciple came to Jesus, yes or no? No, so obviously, prior to this question, there was a bit of a dispute, wasn't there? The disciples had gathered together in some way, shape, or form and had an argument about who is what? The best, the greatest. 
who's first? And they come as a group to Jesus to settle this all-important dispute. Who's the best? In Mark chapter 9, it's even more comical. In Mark chapter 9, this is the event. And they, the disciples and Jesus, came to Capernaum. And when Jesus was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? Now, this is a great question because what this means is that Jesus, in a, in a way, was separated from his disciples. So Jesus saw them, and they're talking in a group, kind of huddled together. Now, this is what I think is great. So they get in the house, and Jesus says, hey, what were you talking about? Did Jesus know what they were talking about? Absolutely. Verse 34, they're smarter here. They're smarter here. But they kept silent. For on the way, they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. At least they knew enough. Us talking? Jesus? No, no we weren't talking. I don't know what you're talking about. Arguing? No, we were praying. That's what was going on, Jesus. I, that was what was happening. So Jesus asked them, hey, what were you guys talking about? The, the simple fact of the matter is they were in an argument. Can you imagine this ludicrous argument? Jesus is walking behind them. Up there, the disciples are arguing. And James says, I'm the greatest. I cast out 12 demons. And John says, I got 13. And then Simon says, oh, yeah, well, I healed 10 lepers. Woo! Look at me. I'm the greatest. I'm the best. I'm the most important. Jesus sat down next to me at dinner last night. You can hear the argument, can't you? Who's the greatest? Who's the best? Who's the most exalted? Who's the highest? So Jesus asked, who are you guys arguing about? And then Jesus sat down and called to the 12th. And he said to them, if anyone will be first, he must be what? Last of all and servant of all. In Jesus' economy, to be last is actually to be first. To be last. To take the back seat. To exalt God, of course, and other people before yourself. That's what it means to be last. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, the Apostle Paul is writing, at 3 and 4, and the Apostle Paul writes this, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, look at this fragment, consider others, what? Better than yourselves. Each of you should not look only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. That is exceptionally hard. Exceptionally hard. Consider others better than yourself. Do you know that this is hard even in the tiniest of things? Kind of glad that Beth left with the kids here for a second because we're going to talk about it right now. All right, so this is what happens, okay? I usually, usually, not all the time, I usually put the kids to bed. I pray with them, sing a couple songs because Beth is with them all day. And so I'll sing with them a couple songs or whatever, put them to bed. That's daddy time with the kids. Uh, it's Olivia, Faith, and Hope. Then I'll come downstairs. Now, in that period of time, Beth has usually at this time put on a television program. Late. She's put on a cheerleading team. She was a cheerleader. She likes cheerleading. I have about as much interest in cheerleading. Uh oh, here she comes. All right. <laughs> She'll put on. Don't worry about it. No, you're fine, sweetie. Ah. Uh, yeah. She'll put on the cheerleading program. And I'll sit down on the couch. Now, this is what happens. I'll tell you what's internally happening in Chris Iger at this point. I say nothing. But what's going on inside of me as I sit down next to her and we're watching the making of cheerleading is I'm thinking to myself, dear God, please move. Stir my wife to say, we can wa I can watch this later. Let's watch something else. But as of late, she hasn't said that. <laughs> as of late, I sit down, and we begin to watch cheerleading. She doesn't move the controller over. She just sits there and watches cheerleading. And inside of myself, I want to die. <laughs> but I say nothing. I watch cheerleading. Such a simple thing, a half hour of cheerleading. You would think should be easy, but it's not because it's exceptionally difficult to consider what? Others 
better than yourself. Even the woman that you pledged your life to. Even the woman that you said you would care. Even the woman that bore you children. It's hard to watch 30 minutes of Fear Leader. Each of you should not look only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Oh, that one's tough. But the kicker is verse 5. Your attitude should be the same as that of what? Of Christ Jesus. Humility is difficult, isn't it? Let's just be honest. Let's take a look at the attitude of Jesus. I want you to open up your Bibles to John 13 for a moment, please. Open up your Bibles to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. If you don't have a Bible, they are available for you in the pews. John chapter 13. John chapter 13. John chapter 13. Please turn there. John 13. John 13. Again, if you do not have a Bible with you, they're there in the pews for you. I'm not going to highlight everything, so I do, uh, I do wish that you would turn to John 13, beginning at verse 1. It's a famous section of Scripture that uh, some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with. John 13. It's the night of the Passover. Jesus is going to have the Lord's Supper. And we begin at John 13, verse 1. Say amen if you're there. Amen. Hallelujah if you need more time. Good. John 13, 1. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, the one who is bathed does not need to wash, except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should also do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. We're going to stop right there. A little bit of context is important. To the Jews at the time that Jesus lived, and Jesus was, of course, the king of the Jews, cleanliness was indeed next to godliness. It was very important to be seen as clean. That was exceptionally important. That was a religious duty. As part of this practice, because Jerusalem was dirty, mucky, grimy, especially during this time of the Passover, where hundreds of thousands of Jewish pilgrims descended upon Jerusalem, it was important for the sake of being clean to have your feet washed. It was the job of the lowest servant in the household to wash feet. The bottom rung. So that's why Peter's first reaction to Jesus attempting to wash his feet was what? No. I know who you are. You're the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are the Christ. There's no way I'm going to let you, who is king, wash my feet. That helps explain why Peter said what he said. But Jesus should be the last of all. Humbled himself and took the place of the dirtiest, least, grimiest servant. He bent down and he washed feet. Have you ever had your feet washed by somebody before? It really is.
is a weird experience. Now, I understand that it's not culturally the thing that we do here in the West. I get that. That's part of what makes it very weird. But if you're sitting down and somebody else is washing your feet, I don't know about you, I've had it happen once or twice in my life. It's very uncomfortable even for me. I don't like to have a person so what? Low. For me, it's low. For me, it's like, come on, stand up. I, I can do this myself. I, I don't like it. And that's because, by definition, I'm sitting higher. And what? They're lower. It's a humbling experience. Now, Jesus takes off his outer garment, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, God in the flesh, and he begins to wash feet to showcase that he is willing to take the place of who? The lowest. Now, what's amazing is verse 3 of our text. It might be verse 2. Verse 2 of our text reads this. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. That means that Judas had already come to the conclusion that he was going to do what? Betray Jesus. Judas had already had his mind set, already been moved by the devil himself to betray Jesus. Was Judas at this supper? Imagine that. Honestly, just imagine that. Jesus is God, so he already knows, doesn't he? He already knows who's going to betray him. He already knows Judas is going to uh, betray him into the hands of evil men. He already knows he's going to go through the crucifixion. He already knows that Judas right now is the tip of that sword. He bends down. He washes Simon's feet. He washes Andrew's feet. He washes Peter's feet. He washes Bartholomew's feet. He washes Thomas's feet. Now that's humbling enough, isn't it? Now, put yourself in that place. You're Jesus. You get to Judas. You know what's in his heart. You know what's in his mind. You know he's a betrayer. What do you do? Well, I'll tell you what Chris Osmond does. Chris Osmond skips to him and washes somebody else. But Jesus doesn't, does he? Can you imagine just that moment? Judas knows what he's going to do. And Jesus bends down, lifts up his foot, and begins to wash it. And looks at Judas with what? Love. His betrayer. He looks at him, and he loves him. And he serves him. Okay. That's what it means to be last. To be last means... You love God and you love other people. We say it all the time, don't we? I have a feeling that when I put up the phrase, be last, you knew what I meant. I have a feeling you absolutely did. The question, we're at this point in the message right now where we answer the what. What does it mean to be last? It means to place yourself on the bottom of the totem pole. It means to serve God and to serve other people unquestioningly. Without thanksgiving. Simply out of love. But I think that you knew that. The question is not, what does it mean to be last? I think we kind of know that. The question is what? How do I do it? Because I got to tell you, Chris Osmond gets in the way of Chris Osmond all the time. The question is not, what does it mean to be last? The question is, how do I get to a place where I actually, authentically, realistically love other people and put their interests before my own? That's a bigger question. That's why I think verse 3 is one of the most important verses in John chapter 13. It helps us understand the whole message. John 13, 3 to 4. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Stop. Does Jesus speak any words here in verse 3 or 4? Jesus is saying nothing. The event is going to be so monumental, the event is going to be so extraordinary, that the author John, by inspiration of course, had to tell the reader, this was the inner thought of Jesus before he did this thing. This was the inner motion. This is what Jesus knew. This is, was Jesus' attitude, knowledge, and faith before he did this extraordinarily humbling thing. John lets us know what it was that Jesus was thinking. 
Because to the reader, this was cosmic. You follow? For Jesus to do this was un uh, unbelievable. So John, to front load this event, says, hey, listen, this is where Jesus got the power to do this. It says, he knew that the Father had given all things into his hands. So what did Jesus know? All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. I have the power to cast out demons, raise the dead, and heal the sick. I can walk on water. I can wither that fig tree. I can calm that storm. He knew where he had come from. Hey, it was just 33 years ago where I was being worshipped as God by the angels. And he knew where he was going. After my death and resurrection, I'm ascending back to the Father. My simple point is this. Jesus knew who he was. He knew that his sufficiency did not come from the feet of the people he was washing. Jesus knew that his image, who he really was inside, did not come from people at all. But it came from God. He was so confident, he was so committed, he was so understanding of who he was, that he did not need approval from who? People. And that gave him freedom. Because I know who I am, because I know what the Father has called me, because I know my nature, I am now free. I'm free from the judgments, I'm free of the opinions, I'm free of what other people think. Because I know who I am with God. That's the how. Jesus knew who he was. Have you ever been around somebody that brags on themselves? Have you ever been around somebody that'll say this? And I'm going to be bold with this because it's a little pet peeve of mine, so forgive your pastor. One of the most irritating things in the world is somebody that brags about what they do. Honestly, exceptionally irritating. Many of us think, I hope people notice what I did. But please be smart enough to not say it. Because there's nothing more unattractive than the person who does something and then says, hey, come here, look what I did. Immediately when those words come out of their mouth, look what I did, the hearer is repulsed. Absolutely repulsed. Because the hearer, all they hear is what? Look at me. Look what I did. Look what I accomplished. It's called being a bragger. Nobody likes it. Everybody hates it. When you, when you hear about somebody talking up themselves. Well, I gave this, or I did this, or I did that, or I did that. Now why, here's the thing. Why do you think people brag on themselves? Because they actually don't think a lot or that much about what? Themselves. The more a person heaps praise on themselves, the more you know deep down they think very little of themselves. Which is why they are heaping praise on themselves. In a weird kind of sick dimension, they're trying to convince themselves that what? I'm good. I'm okay. The bragging actually shows everybody else what? You're not okay. We all know it. That's what's really going on. You're trying to find your sufficiency what? From the opinions of other people. You know that when you do that, you actually make yourself a slave. You know that? A slave to others. Jesus never did that. Jesus knew who he was. Jesus did not need to be stroked. Jesus did not be, need to be told a thousand times, I love you, you're amazing. Oh my goodness, it's fantastic. We have never seen anybody like you. You're unbelievable. Jesus never needed to be told that. Why? Because he knew who he was. That's the key. That's the key. So let me ask you the question. Who are you? If somebody asks you, who are you? How do you answer that question? Because I think, as Americans, we answer that question poorly. When I ask somebody, who are you? Uh, I'm a mom. I'm a father. I'm a husband. I'm a wife. I'm a plumber. 
I'm a politician. I'm a janitor. I'm this, I'm that, and the other thing. These are all very bad answers to that question. Because here's the thing. If you answer, that's not who you are. That is what? What you do. And it does not have lasting impact. Let me ask, it, am I, forgive me. It does not have an eternal impact. You're not that forever. That's what I meant by that. Ask you this. Are you going to be in your occupation for eternity, yes or no? No. Did Jesus come, <laughs> did Jesus come to, listen very cl closely. Do you need Jesus to be a mother? Yes, in the sense that he gives you life. What I mean is, do you need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you need to be saved in order to be a mother? Yes or no? No. Do you need to be saved in order to be a husband? Yes or no? Do you need to be saved in order to work in your occupation? Yes or no? So Jesus did not come to earth. Jesus did not live. Jesus did not die. Jesus did not rise again to make you a mom, a dad, a brother, a sister, a husband, a wife, a plumber, a janitor, a lawyer, or a doctor. Because those things can be accomplished, what? Without him. Why did Jesus become a blastocyst, a fetus, a baby, a man? Why did he cast out demons, raise the dead, heal the sick? Why did he die? Why did he rise again? Why did he ascend to heaven? Why did he give us his spirit? Not so that we would be simply a husband, a wife, a plumber, a janitor, but so that we would become, go from being an enemy to what? A child. A child of God. Accepted by him. Forgiven by him. Redeemed by him. Purchased by him. Jesus did not baptize you so that you could be a mom or a dad. Jesus does not give you a, the sacrament so that you can be in whatever occupation you want to be in. I am not delegitimizing those things. What I'm saying is none of those things are your identity. Because if they are, you're making your identity dependent upon what? Other people. Somebody asks me this question. Chris, who are you? This is how I answer this question. I'm Christopher Michael Ogden, child of the living God. That's who I am. Can I be that without being a pastor, yes or no? Can I be that without being a husband, yes or no? Can I be that without being a father, yes or no? Absolutely. Can I be that with a house? Yep. Can I be that without a house? Can I be that with money? Can I be that without money? So here's the thing. I could lose my wife. I could lose my kids. I could lose my job. I could lose my home. I could lose my community. And I would still be Christopher Michael Ogden, child of the living God. That's why Jesus came. Jesus came to make you his child. And that is where we need to find our sufficiency. We need to know who we are. Because here's the thing. If I know that God loves me, if I know that God has saved me, if I know I have the promise of heaven and the privilege of prayer, if I know that I have a relationship with God that is going to be based in eternity, then I'm free. I'm free to serve you. Because I'm no longer looking to be filled, what? By you. That's how to become last. Know who you are. So what I'm going to do is put up this last slide. You're going to say your name in the blank. And we're all going to say it together. What I want you to catch this morning is this. Jesus came, he died, and he rose again to make you his child. That's what you will be for eternity. That's who you are. And if you catch that, you'll actually be free. You'll be free to serve. So on the count of three, I want us all to say, and in the blank you say your name. One, two, three. I am Christopher Michael Agni, child of the living God. That's who you are. And that's why you can be last. Because God made you first through his son Jesus. Amen? God is good. All the time. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, dear Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, we thank you. You are a good, a holy, and awesome, and a gracious God. We thank you for placing us first in your heart through your son Jesus so that we can be last. And love you and serve others. Amen. We now continue with our tithes and our offerings.